Um, thank you, Steve. Um, there are only 26 people in hedge funds in Asia. Uh, that's one of the one of the uh, one of the dirty little secrets about Asia is, is that there aren't that many people there um, in the hedge fund industry. I, I've I've been in Asia since uh, oh god 1996, so I celebrate 20 years in May. Um, I like to say that I had uh, two years off for good behaviour. Uh, in the middle of that, in 2005-2006, we sold the, the bank that I was working for. We sold to HSBC. And I got moved to uh, New York, Manhattan, for a couple of years. So I had the pleasure of working there. I know that's not America, but at least I worked in this uh, in this part of the world for a couple of years as well. I had another year in the States before that. I also have lived and worked in France for four years. Um, so all in all, a reasonably sort of um, checkered background from that perspective. And I guess that's really why the institute asked me uh, to do this role. Um, as much as anything, the Institute now, and again, as Stephen said, you know, we, we're, we're open in, uh, we have 146 societies around the world in something like 79 countries now. Uh, and we also have seven offices, seven Institute offices uh, in the world too. In uh, most recently, Mumbai and Beijing, uh, Hong Kong, those are the three Asian uh, offices, um, Brussels and London uh, in the EMEA region. New York and uh, Charlottesville, which is our head office, and will remain so um, in uh, in the state. So, so really, it is it is a, a, a genuinely global business, and ever becoming more so. So that's uh, that's something that I think, um, as you can hear, I'm English. So thank you for the weather. That uh, <laughs> makes me feel very much at home. Um, but uh, I haven't lived there uh, an awfully long time. The way I, I do it at the moment is I, I'm sort of constantly on a plane. So I flew in last night from Africa. Uh, I, was, uh, I was there visiting one of the societies uh, in Mauritius, uh, in fact, which is um, home of the dodo, or was home of the dodo before, the, uh, before everybody ate them all, um, uh, which is just off the coast of Madagascar. So I apologize if I, feel, if I sound a little bit spacey today, it's because I am. Um, so, but what I try to do is 40% is of my time uh, in the Americas, 20% in Europe, and 40% of my time in Asia. That works out at about 48 days a year in Charlottesville, 12 or 30 in uh, our office in New York, and the balance traveling around the Americas region. And one of the uh, peculiarities about the Institute over the years has been we've never had an Americas region. Uh, we've had a European region, and we've had an Asian region, but we've never had an, Asian, uh, an American region. And that has led, bizarrely, to a very strange thing in the Institute, which is that we have never really focused on supporting our America's region's societies as well as we should. We have no dedicated resources uh, against America's to help you with things like marketing, to help you with, obviously, society relations, to help you with employer relations, to help you with uh, university relations. There's never been dedicated resources against that. So that was something that I wanted to, to change, and that's John. John, why don't you just stand up a second and wave at, uh, at uh, so, so John, <laughs> John, John is part of our, our leadership team of, of uh, 12 or 30 individuals. And John has been with us many, many years, has been asked specifically to pull together that team. Uh, and working for John is Dan, uh, uh, Dan O'Connor, who runs uh, or works in the team that specifically looks at uh, partnerships with businesses. So John's job is really to help the Institute focus on its Americas, regions, societies, and to support you much more. And um, that's the, the, the key word under, you know, I took over in January. The key thing that I've been trying to do is to say that really what the Institute needs to do is to focus. And what we're trying to focus on are two or three things. Firstly, um, uh, building the investment profession. And we try to take investment and say, well, actually, that's not very helpful. That's in our, in our mission statement, is to lead the investment profession. But actually, what we've said is that doesn't give us, in fact, enough focus. Um, because the investment profession covers a whole multitude of sins, sell side by side, all sorts of things. And so, what I've tried to say is that really where we live is the investment management profession. It's people who manage people's money, whether that's high net worth individuals all the way through to sovereign wealth funds. But the way that we're going to interpret the investment profession is to say that everything that we do 
needs to be to support professionals in the field who are managing people's money. So that was the, the first thing. Now, that's controversial, and obviously lots of, I'm, I'm very happy to take questions at any time during this. That is controversial. A lot of people say, well, um, you know, in some of our societies, 60% of our members have nothing to do with the investment management profession. They could be an accountant, they could be lawyers, they could be, uh, you know, anything. And my comment back to that is yes, but you have to ask yourself why they could become CFAs and what it is that they're interested in when they turn up at events like this one this morning. They're not interested in you doing programming about accountancy or about legal issues. They're interested in you doing programming about investment management subjects. And that's really all I'm trying to do at the Institute is to say that we can build a bigger family of people who are interested, but what we have to do is to be specialists, to be expert in the investment management field. And if we can do that, then we will attract to us all of these other people uh, in associated professions, in support professions, and all sorts of other um, uh, lines that are interested, including the sell side, that are interested in knowing more about investment management. So it's not, and I repeat it, it really is not meant to be an exclusionary message, it's meant to be an inclusionary message around focus. And I was reading something the other day that it's, it's interesting, I mean, I, you know, I've always, you know, when I'm in the Deep South, I'm very conscious that culture here is, yeah, is, is, is different to other parts of the world I go in. It's, it's very like running a church, basically. If you don't actually say, you know, what does the church believe in, why would you expect to build a congregation? And uh, that's really what we're trying to do uh, with the Institute, is to pin our colors to the mast, say that where we live is investment management. Now, why is that important from my perspective? Is because the Institute, my analysis of, of what's gone wrong with the Institute over the last five or six years is not that we need a new logo, or that we need a new name, or that we need a new uh, mission statement, none of those things. What's gone wrong, really, is that we've become a little bit fuzzy around the edges, and we no longer know what it is that we're really in business to do. And so defining that investment management focus was important. The second thing to say is that our focus is on our members. And I'm sure that's not a message that will go down badly uh, in this room, uh, that we are first, second, and last a membership organization that is seeking to lead the investment profession. We are not an educational organization that has members stuck on the side. We're a membership organization that has an excellent credential that credentials people to join the investment profession where our members live and work and are focused on. So that focus on members, on, on stakeholders, is absolutely vital because it then leads to all of those other thoughts, connecting up all of those other thoughts about trying to be global, um, which is how do we become more impactful, which is the third area of focus, you know, in the communities that we seek to serve. How do we, how do we create more impact? Uh, we have 630 people at the Institute now. 630 people, that's an awful lot of people. And um, I question, and that's one of the things that I'm trying to bring to the Institute, how much impact those 630 people and all of the activities that they do have on our members and on the communities that the members serve. So um, again, what we're trying to do in the Institute is to look at everything that we do and say to ourselves, is this having impact on our members? In the right way, obviously, it's supposed to negative impact. Um, and if not, stop it and do something else. So trying to bring that focus, and there are lots and lots, and I'm sure you all have around in, in this room, you all have your, your own particular things that you wish the Institute didn't do or did do or whatever. So it's trying to, trying to collect those in and say, well, how do we become much more focused around impact? And all of that leads to this, this uh, you know, we need to listen to our members more, and we need to work through our members through their societies more. So the final, the final main message, before I get into the detail of what we're trying to do, is to say that it should be an embarrassment to the Institute that we have about 10%, or it is an embarrassment to the Institute, that we have 10% of our members at the Institute level who are not members of local societies. That is not a good thing. We should have 100% of the Institute membership 
mirrored within the societies. No one should be an institute member and not a society member. Why? It's because through the societies is my best effort or my best uh, option of trying to influence the communities in which we live to build this investment profession. Because otherwise I have to talk to 130,000 people, at least if I took, do it through societies, I only have uh, 146 stakeholders. So for me, it's obvious that if, if, I, if I really believe that working through the membership is the best way of building this investment management profession, then working through the societies has to be the most sensible method of delivering that. So everything that we're trying to do is to focus on the societies, focus on our members' needs through the societies, and figure out how we can support the societies better. And I hope um, those who are involved in the, uh, in the Atlantic Society at the board level uh, have begun to see, and we'll go through some of those things, have begun to see that that is, uh, is, is just beginning. Um, and um, you know, I'm fully conscious that, that there's lots of history here in the US. Um, one of the good things about never having worked for the Institute in the US is that I'm totally oblivious to all of that history, so uh, it doesn't concern me or interest me in any way whatsoever. Um, I'm, I'm going to do my own thing, and hopefully uh, it fits in um, with, uh, with what the Atlantic Society wants to achieve uh, as well. Uh, and over time, because time is, is really the only factor when you're trying to build trust, uh, between people over time, I hope we can build uh, a very trusting relationship where uh, you can uh, listen to what I say without trying to strain it through um, the, the, uh, uh, the cynical historical experience that, uh, uh, that some of you may have. Um, so that's the sort of rather long-winded preamble. Um, well, you know, a lot of very, very positive things. Um, I know that's often not, not uh, obvious uh, here in the U.S., but but perhaps in Latin America, where our America's region uh, is as well. We're very excited about countries like Brazil and Mexico, uh, for instance, which are two focuses there. Um, the middle class is actually exploding at the moment, particularly in Africa and Asia. Uh, global assets are compounding out at about 6% per annum at the moment, uh, and should hit uh, 100 trillion uh, from about 75 trillion today, 75 to 80 trillion today. So a lot of growth, very positive background. The thing we like to say is that the world has never needed investment management experience more than it needs today. And what we're trying to do now, and I still haven't got the cadence, the tone right, is to sort of migrate from, from the post-GFC, sort of post-global financial crisis tone of sort of lecturing everybody about how bad they've been uh, into trying to say, well, yeah, you know, we've got issues, but we need to say that actually there's a very positive backdrop to our industry. Society has never needed us more, and if we get our house in order, then we have a great opportunity as an industry, and furthermore, society around the world, particularly in the developing world, uh, needs uh, uh, highly skilled investment management professionals now more than ever. So I'm trying to, trying to sort of change gears a little bit from that sort of lecturing, hectoring, hectoring sort of preachy tone that I think we've had over the last five or six years to try to, to try to say some much more positive things about what we can do as a community to help um, uh, reconnect with our client base uh, and uh, to move forward. Um, good news is that um, uh, asset management con continues to be an incredibly uh, profitable uh, uh, profession. It's still the, the, the net margins in asset management is still about 32, 33 percent. Uh, revenues per employee and, and pay per employee uh, have still gone up. Um, the good news is that on pay uh, per employee, that $157,000 uh, uh, number, uh, investment <coughs> banks now on average pay about $163,000. Private financial, prior to the financial crisis, the investment banks were probably paid about twice what an investment management professional was. Now there's virtually no difference whatsoever. Uh, it comes back to something that um, uh, Steve and I were talking about earlier on today as well, which is that we really need, as part of the branding campaigns, and I'll come back to that later, really need to differentiate ourselves better from the rest of Wall Street and from other aspects of the financial services community out there, uh, because we are, uh, we are different. Global AUM, as I said, uh, is rising. Um, passage uh, increasing, but still 
uh, a relatively small amount. Um, the, the thing that I find interesting is this uh, is the alternatives world here, which is my old world. Um, still only 13% of, of assets under management in 2020, but uh, projected to be about 40% of net profits from the alternative world. One of the big themes that we are trying to get over is that businesses need to um, remodel their business models a little bit so that clients feel that businesses are really being run for their benefit and not for the benefit of the investment management industry. And so that number worries me a lot when you think about it, 13% of the assets, 40% of the profits, obviously the margins on alternative assets are considerably greater than they are on other types of investment management activity. Whether we are advising our clients into the right products for them, or whether we are advising our clients into the right products for us, I think is, is a big issue uh, going forward. Um, and um, you know, I think that's, that's a challenge that we need to talk much more about. Uh, institutional ownership, as we know, is still uh, rising. Um, high net worth individuals, 30% um, uh, of our membership now in the US is in the high net worth market. We are finally at the institute level waking up to that, that if we are to uh, serve our membership, we have to recognize that 30% of them, one way or another, are dealing in the private wealth management space. And that space obviously is under pressure from CFPs, from accountants, uh, from other bodies out here. And so how, again, do we tell our story? How do we differentiate ourselves uh, from those groups? Uh, how do we make sure that that 30% of our membership here in the US is properly served is, uh, I can assure you now, uh, front and center. Um, that's just to say that Asia Pacific now is as important, in theory, a private client center as, uh, as the Americas are, uh, but it's, uh, or as North America is, but that's uh, uh, somewhat of an illusion in that private clients in Asia are very differently motivated, invest in lots of different things, much, much harder to get to than private clients here in the US are. So although the number is the same, most of that money is still tied up within their operating business. Uh, it's spread over many, many different cultures and countries. Uh, and then finally, because it's mostly still first or at best second generation wealth, it doesn't really invest down into financial products today. So, so although that gets the private banking community um, uh, very, um, very sort of excited, uh, I, I actually think it's um, it's a bit of an illusion to, to say that least. private banking in Asia is really very, very difficult indeed. But there are some negatives. I mean, uh, passive investing I think is very interesting, and again, it comes back from um, so you know generally a positive backdrop. But there are some things that that concern us. Uh, the rise of passive investing concerns us because obviously it's, it's nibbling away at our margins and is set to grow. Personally, I think it's a very good thing, um, and uh, you know we are um, uh, uh, we're not at the issue level. We're not against passive investing. It's a method of, of running people's money like any any other. Why do I think it's good? It's because I think it plays to this idea of business models. Uh, if you can deliver to your clients in a cheap, uh, cost-effective way then it makes you, as a financial practitioner, think a little bit about what value you are adding and how do you describe that value uh, and how do you prove that value to your clients. And I think that's, that's, again, that's part of what we're trying to do in our thought leadership work, is to say um, one of, one of, the, one of the, um, the things that I think we've lost over the last six or seven years is a little bit of self-confidence as an industry um, under uh, sort of the rise of passive investing under uh, you know, what went on in the global financial crisis where a lot of the academic theory was proved to be leaky at best. Um, we've kind of lost our way a little bit, I think, as an industry in terms of what value it is that we actually do bring to our clients. And I think that's something that the Institute can help with uh, in terms of its research. And John actually is about to head up a, uh, uh, a project for us uh, to delve into some of these topics. How can we better prove to our end clients that having us is a good thing rather than going through passive investing uh, or robo-advisors, for instance, that you do need, at the end of the day, you do need a qualified financial professional to help you with your investments. 
and that that adds value to your portfolio management process, that that will help you in terms of your risk adjusted returns, that will help you in terms of outcome investing, rather than uh, all too often what the general public hears about us is that North American Fund competes against uh, A, competes against North American Fund B, and after the deduction of fees, that's a less than a zero sum game. We have to raise the debate from that sort of very basic product level towards you know, what is it that we're really trying to do as an institute, uh, as, a, as a profession, in terms of delivering value to our clients over the long haul so that they can achieve their investment expectations and outcomes, whether that's saving for the family holiday, putting the kids through university, or obviously having a, a long and, and healthy and happy retirement. But how do we help people achieve those goals better than we currently uh, do? And I think, uh, again, one of the things that I, I quite like thinking about is, is I, you know, I, I've lived for a large chunk of my um, recent life in, in the developing world. And uh, when you live in the developing world, it's much, much easier, perhaps, to see the value of investment management and finance than it is when you're here in North America, where a lot of the activity becomes very much count, professional counterparty to professional counterparty. When you live in the developing world, uh, the one thing that strikes you is that the absence of a fully functioning financial community is the single biggest issue behind why countries cannot grow and cannot develop. So the curiosity in my life is that when I go to Africa or Asia or Latin America, we have great resonance with the regulators, with the employers, with the investors, with the universities there. They know that they need us and they want us and they want to support the CFA in China, in India. Um, they, uh, the, the regulators are so pro the CFA, you'd be amazed if you went there. They're absolutely convinced of the need of having a bigger financial community as a percentage of their GDP, not a smaller one. There's nobody talks about too much finance in China. Um, so uh, it's, it's very interesting and we, we, we therefore we, we, um, uh, we get a lot further faster in the developing world than we do when we're talking in Washington, for instance, where we're one voice amongst a hundred. Uh, we don't have the lobbying dollars uh, that a lot of other people have. The same in Brussels, the same in London. <coughs> So it's a, it's a peculiar world that our, our membership, much more powerful here in North America than anywhere else in the world, but in terms of influencing the environment in which we work, um, often, not always, but often, um, it's, it's the other way around. Our smaller societies punch way above their weight in terms of their ability to get us through the right doors to influence um, the world that they are, uh, are working in. So I know, um, I mean, just to digress, I know that's, you know, for a lot of people in the US, um, the development in uh, Asia uh, particularly is concerning, and I think rightly so. Um, you know, 50% of our candidates now come from uh, Asia, 50%. Still only uh, about 20% of our membership is in Asia. We have huge, huge charter pending problems in Asia, i.e. people who've passed all three levels but haven't converted to CFAs. We have huge lapse rates in Asia. In India, for instance, um, uh, every year, 25% of all charter holders give up their charter. 25%, here in the States, it'd be about 4%. Um, so, enormous issues when we're talking in Asia about the value of a profession, obviously the value of what we do, for sure, and of what our societies do, are we doing enough uh, in the right way, in a cost-effective fashion, to impact our members' lives. There's all of that. But there's also another aspect to it in Asia, which is that um, uh, a lot of people are not uh, intuitively grasping what it means to be a professional and why they should contribute towards the profession. It's a lot harder. It's not historically as well-rooted as it is here in the Americas. And a lot of people have a challenge with that. They say, well, why are you bothering? basically, why, why, why are we diluting effectively our brand by uh, working uh, in emerging markets? And it's a, it's a very fair question, and I think you know, it's one that I think a lot about. Um, but the, uh, I guess you come down on one of two sides as far as that is concerned. Either you believe that through engagement we can improve uh, the quality of professionalism and the quality of the uh, investment management industry in those countries, 
or we should be disengaged and let them get on with it for themselves and see where they get to and re-engage in 10 or 15 years' time. And we have taken at the Institute for the first course that, uh, no, it's not perfect, there are issues, uh, there are definitely challenges uh, in what we do in the developing world in general in terms of people's view of what the Institute is, what the CFA is, and what being a professional is, very definitely um, uh, differences there. But over time, if we do our job properly, hopefully we can converge these views uh, over the long haul. So that's, uh, sorry, a bit of a digression. But. The other negative I think that's happening uh, is regulatory scrutiny. I'm sure I don't have to tell anybody in this room that regulation uh, is increasing. And in my view, uh, the Institute's view is only going to go one way, which is more and more and more and more and more invasive regulation as well. And we have to accept that at the end of the day, regulators are politicians like anybody else. They don't live on Mount Olympus. They're political appointees. They respond to what the general public, uh, through their appointed representatives in theory, um, tell them they're worried about. And our lack of appeal to our end investors, I think, is directly the cause of a lot of the regulation uh, that we're seeing and a lot of the increasing regulation that we're seeing around the world. It's not just here in the States. Uh, Europe. Uh, is uh, awash with uh, new regulatory issues at present, uh, and Asia is as well. And I think it's going to only go one way. Um, so uh, again, why should we build a profession? We should build a profession because a profession, one of the marks of a profession is that a profession is allowed a little bit of autonomy over its own life. If you think about doctors, lawyers, accountants, they're allowed a little bit of, of self-regulation. Please believe me, not trying to set the CFA up as an SRO or anything like that, but a profession is allowed to, to some extent, dictate its own life. Um, and if we cannot create that link between ourselves as professionals and society, then society's only option, because society knows that we do a valuable job, is to regulate us. And I think that's, uh, that's happening uh, all too obviously uh, around the world uh, today, and I think it will get worse. Uh, because we've got a lot to do to sort of build the, uh, the profession. One of the other things I'd like to say is that if we're to build a profession properly, then we have to change. If we believe that prior to 2008 we weren't covering ourselves in glory, then we also have to look at the inputs and the outputs. Um, our inputs are still pretty poor uh, in uh, from just one aspect of diversity, which is gender diversity, which is a big issue as far as the Institute is concerned at the moment. Uh, the Americas region uh, has the least women representatives uh, in it of uh, all three regions, um, but no region has anything really to write home about. Bizarrely, the only country that does is China. 51% of our members, 51% of our candidates in China are women. Don't ask me why. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole different ball of wax, but 51% but uh, are. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do through our Women in Investment Management Initiative is just to make the simple point that gender diverse teams are going to create better thinking and better outcomes for investors than single sex teams are likely to do, whether that's single sex women team, women's teams, or single sex men's, uh, men's teams. What's important uh, is the diversity of the thought process. And um, if we want to change the outputs, then we have to change the inputs. So we're trying to work at the university level uh, much, much more using all sorts of different tools and techniques to try to appeal to young women who are doing the right sort of courses at universities, but for one reason or another are not coming into our profession. And we're trying to do some research work around that. And one of the issues, I think, is, is a brand issue that we've sort of scratched upon. A lot of women, a lot of young women, don't want to come into finance because they see it not only as a, as a male-dominated profession, but they also see it as a very self-absorbed profession that doesn't have much linkage to some form of societal output. So I think all of these things are connected in terms of the way that we should talk and think about them, is if we are to raise the percentage of women uh, in our industry, then we have to change our brand image, and we have to reconnect ourselves with what we're trying to do. Uh, that's the membership. Uh, that first slide was the candidates. This is the membership, which obviously is even worse. Um, and if you think about the Asian Pacific bar, 24%, that has India in it, where only 4% of our members are women, and also Japan, 
we're also only 4% of our members are women. So uh, the rest of Asia actually is a long way ahead of that, 24%. So um, as I say, big, big initiative, and all part of this, you know, how do we build a healthier, more stable profession that appeals to society as a whole? And again, it comes back into that, a lot of that um, thinking about uh, how 30% uh, of our membership now is also in the wealth management world. Lots of studies that women are much more successful in the wealth management world than men are, um, simply because they listen better than men do. See myself excluded. <laughs> um, what's wrong with the investment industry is I've tried to say that we, I think we have uh, some unethical practices. We have a poor value proposition. Fees are inappropriate of them. Quarter over quarter focus on investment performance, not long term um, uh, performance. So lots of trust, regulatory intervention, declining intermediation, and a lot of non-fee paying assets around the world. So that's kind of the problem. So what are we what are we going to do about it? Well, this is what we're meant to be trying to do. Uh, so leaving the investment profession, um, uh, and I think there are lots of lots of sort of aspects of, of all of that that hopefully I'll, I'll touch upon. That's where we are at the moment. That's the membership, still overwhelmingly uh, American, uh, which I'm very conscious of, despite all the things that I've said. That's why we built the America's team under John, or building the America's team under John. Uh, it's that we have a disproportionate focus on Europe and Asia uh, in many ways within the Institute, and we're trying to uh, sort of turn that, that back. Um, so that's where we are. Today. Um, I love that slide. That goes to my agenda slide. That's the first CFA exam, 1963. Not much diversity there. There was also, there was also, there was also an age bar in 1963. You had to be over 38, I think, to take the exam. I met someone in LA uh, about six months ago, hilarious, fabulous old boy, who was excluded from that because he was only 27 or something. Like that. And it, yeah, no, he was excluded from sitting in that class. Um, we, um, the only other point I want to make is that, as you can see, when the CFA started in 1963, um, you could have, you could say it was kind of a PhD, in that then, then people were doing it who had great seniority in the profession. Quite obviously, um, I don't suppose any of those people were, uh, were in their first two or three years of their. <laughs> was it a top requirement? Sorry. Was it top? I, I don't know whether it's top was, was, was required or not. But. I think that was just the standards of the day. Um, and today, our candidates are all, mainly all, in that first four to five years of their profession. So they're sort of between the ages of 25 and 29, and I'm sure you see that here in Atlanta. So the CFA has changed in terms of what it is. I think that's important um, for everybody also to sort of accept. And the genie, no matter what you think about that, the genie is not going back into that bottle. Uh, anytime soon. Um, we are, and the way the curriculum is driven, we are an examination of credential for people who are entering this profession or who are in the first four to five years of their professional life. That's what the CFA is geared towards doing. We do this thing called practice analysis, which I'm sure some of you have been involved in, where we go around and we talk to CIOs around the world about what they want, what they want us to be educating, to be teaching people in that first four or five years of their careers. And that's the way the curriculum functions. It's not a PhD. It's not this thing that we all think that we've got that make us sort of ninja warriors of the investment management world. It's a, it's a basic um, qualification. Now, um, that wasn't me who designed it that way. That's, that's what I uh, inherited. But I think it is important when we talk about the professional building a profession, because um, what we're trying to do through that curriculum and through that focus is over time basically say that every single person coming into the investment management industry who wants to run money on a fiduciary basis should have our credential. That's where we're going. Okay? So we're not trying to say that the CFA Institute and the credential is for a very narrow group of savants, of, of Freemasonry of investment professionals, that is designed towards keeping our uh, uh, salaries up 
because there are only a few of us out there in the world. Okay, so I want to be very explicit about that. That isn't what the Institute is about and hasn't been what the Institute is about, uh, has been about for many, many years, massively predates me. What we haven't done is to say this in public. And so that's what I'm trying to do is to say, uh, you know, and I know there are a lot of people in the Americas region particularly who are extremely uncomfortable with that. Depends on your vintage. If you're from this class, then uh, you know, that will disappoint you hugely. If you took the exam any time in the last 20 years, it won't come as a surprise to you. If you're in that sort of 35 to 20 year bracket, then uh, you know, I think it's a different institute today than it was when you took your professional credential. And I can apologize for that, but I can't do anything about it. That is the, that is the path that we're on and that's where the Institute is, is going. So when I think about building a profession, um, when you, again, when you think about doctors, 10% um, of doctors don't have a medical degree. 100% of doctors have a medical degree and a practicing certificate. And so if we're to build a profession, 100% of everybody who touches client money in fiduciary capacity should have a credential. Not necessarily our one, they may be competing credentials globally and, and, and even here in the US, but what we should be espousing is 100% of people who are managing other people's money should have an appropriate credential. We believe that our credential is the best. I would like 100% of everybody to have it. That's my aspirational goal. That is not the same as saying I am going to reduce the standard of the CFA to get everybody through it. Those two things are not identities. So we must maintain the standard, and I'm absolutely passionate about that, and one of the things that we want to talk about in terms of our, of our positive plan for industry is to say, well, industry, you need to bring your people up to our standard. You need to give young people the time off to study. If you're a lawyer or a doctor, you're not, you're not expected to do uh, a job between the hours of eight and seven and then go home and study for three hours. It doesn't work that way you get time off or you do it before you enter. The structure of our profession is very poor for getting people through what we believe is the appropriate standard for anybody running client money. So our message to industry is we've set the, the bar where we believe it's correct to set it. You have to change the way that you think about bringing people into this profession, training uh, people for this profession, and what it is that you're trying to get out of those people longer term. So that's, I think, a very positive message about raising standards in the industry rather than depressing standards. So what we've done is to sort of divide ourselves into uh, three, uh, three strategic functions. The first is credentialing, which is looking after our three programs, the CFA program, Claritas, and CIPN. Um, with a view to developing future professionals, and those are a few things, so I think that there's, there's uh, uh, much there that um, is, is uh, controversial. Um, but trying to make professionals um, uh, who can enter into society. The one thing that uh, I will say there is obviously continuing professional development and seal of approval from society are two of the issues that I think we need to uh, uh, collectively uh, agree on. I have no mandate, I can promise you, for mandatory continuing professional education. Um, but obviously, continuing professional education is something that is important to profession uh, and, important, and important to professionals, so you'll see us continuing to try to work on that. Uh, and approval from society uh, is, is um, I think, something we don't really think enough about. We're all very keen to call ourselves professionals, but a profession isn't something that is self-declared. A profession is something that actually society determines, not us. And the way that society shows whether you're a professional or not, is by, as I said earlier, giving you a little bit of autonomy, um, but also by building um, some legal moats around what it is that you do, trying to prevent people who do not have your credential from practicing as investment managers, for instance. And we are a long, long way from that um, uh, ideal, if you like. Uh, in many countries, my favorite joke, this is honestly true, but don't ask me to name them, it's actually harder to become a hairdresser than it is to become an investment manager. And um, you know, that's, that's not 
a good thing. So trying to build up with regulators, with society in general, um, their appreciation of what we do and why um, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can be a value to them is, is very important. So the second strategic function that we provided our organization into is member value, which is trying to deliver value to you, and I'll give you some numbers on that uh, later on. But you know, you pay me 275 US dollars a year. If I took a straw poll in this room and said to each one of you, how much value do you think I give you? You wouldn't say 275 US dollars. You would say $100 or $150 or whatever the number. We actually spend about 1,000 US dollars a head on every member. So, two or three takeaways from that. One is that we don't explain what we spent that money on very well. And secondly, and probably most importantly, we waste a lot of that money. Uh, you don't feel it. So we are really trying to work very hard on giving you member value back. So the first thing that we've done is to increase the money that we pay back to societies by 50%. So you've already seen that. That came through on the 1st of September. So the operating subsidy that we pay each society, we've increased by 50%, and the idea over the next five years is that we will double that again. So taking that $275, and in five years' time, giving you straight back about $150 of that amount to your local society. So that's an important, an important initiative as far as that is concerned. It isn't actually solving the problem. What it is doing is transferring the problem from me to your local board. So I'm very, very conscious of that, but in future when people, when I attend events like this and people start lobbying red rolls at me, I'll be able to say, well, don't look at me, look at Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> I think we want to leave enough time for questions. Oh, sorry, yeah. So, so that's the same. And we've also increased brand spending in there as well, which is the other thing that we've done, which uh, we're, we're increasing uh, dramatically the amount of money that we're spending on brand. Um, so those are the, so increasing society spending, doubling the spending on brand, and investing in society technology. And the third is the standards and advocacy area. Those are the numbers that I was trying to talk to you about that um, we spend um, today on member value 36% of our revenue. Our revenue is about 250 million US dollars. So 36% is spent on member value. And I think that's probably about it. Yeah, nothing really. So what we're trying to do um, is to resolve that equation, as I say. So demanding high, high entry standards, um, trying to help through the member value of our members to be as best professionals as they can be, uh, engage with our local communities, obviously, encouraging businesses to change their business models, uh, and trying to prove our value to society um, in terms of everything that we do. So that's the sort of our recipe for success, and I'll end on that. Very happy to take any questions on anything at all. Um, the first is um, comparing us to uh, doctors or accountants. Um, the problem is measurement of the service yeah. by the individuals, um, by the customers. If you're talking about investment management, It's a three-cornered fight. It's one, 
it's one it's for us as a profession to work harder to and there are lots of studies and we're going to commission a few more you know, how do private advisors add value and can we measure that so that's that piece of it can you also measure the risk adjusted nature of that return as, as well and try and figure that out um, you've then got the regulatory but then you've got the third piece that Stephen was talking about is foundation ideas earlier on, which is investor education. None of this works, to, to your point, unless investors understand much more about what we do. Now, I don't think the Institute can get involved too deeply in financial literacy globally. I mean, that's just an enormous... That's it. But what we can do is encourage governments uh, and loan resources and do things like that to help with general financial literacy programs. So I see it as sort of a free piece of uh, event that we can do some stuff with regulators. We can certainly look at our own activities, talk about business models, how we can prove that we're actually putting our clients' interests above our own, which I think is a big issue for most businesses. Um, you know, one, of the, one of my great things about uh, professionalization is there's a wonderful quote out there that says, a true professional renounces profit maximization. That is a really, that's, that, I almost got lynched in Australia when I said that <laughs> <laughs> at, at a conference. But it's true, you know, a professional puts his client above themselves. And, um, you know, it's a tough one for us because some of us are publicly owned businesses. Well, that leads to my second question. Oh. <laughs> are you looking analytically? professional body, we're not a trade association, so I, if you're English like me, and I don't know whether you realize that last month the head of the trade association in the UK got whacked because he was saying things like this about renouncing profit maximization because he's a trade person. His industry turned around Schroders and Energy in London and they insisted on firing him. Um, so it's very interesting that at the public end of the market, people, and I think the public see this, People hear our slogans, you know, we put investors first, or whatever, but they know it's, it's BS, basically. So how can we prove that? I think there's a, there's a talk for non-publicly owned companies, there's a real opportunity there, I think. So yes, we, we want to look at that side. Well, this is kind of following on that theme, which is how many professions really, in actuality, put their clients first. Yeah. Because if you've been reading any stuff about some of the healthcare scandals, whether no they're being, <laughs> being mortal or how we do harm, I mean, doctors are out there getting Those incentive no compensation yeah. for suggesting all kinds of procedures. Yeah. And, and so it's, yeah. I'm, I'm starting to wonder how realistic, it, I, I'm in favor of putting clients first, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to play too much of the devil's advocate, but it can, Disclosure and transparency accomplish a lot, even if you cannot realistically put clients' interests first. I, 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 think, I think the answer to that must be yes. Um, and I think your, your point is an excellent one. What doctors have succeeded in doing is, is pulling off the most amazing contract, basically, at the end of the day, which is to make their clients feel. You know, when I go into a doctor's surgery, I, I you know, I vaguely in the back of my mind know that they may be pushing me a drug that they're getting a kickback on or something like that. But I generally sit down in front of the doctor and think that they're thinking about me first and foremost in, in their life. No, I'm not disputing it, but they, they've worked that trick. We, uh, we, when most of our investors sit in front of us, we, we're not there yet. <laughs> they've got all sorts, of, all sorts of different assumptions and thoughts going through their mind. And I think transparency, uh, full disclosure, how do we make our fees, discussion on whether our fees are appropriate, uh, often both within the product and what we charge as, as, uh, for advice, all of those things I think will go a long way, yes. Um, and, and so I, I, you know, I totally agree with you. I don't, think it's, I don't think there's any sort of magic bullet out there. It's about, it's about how do we better demonstrate as a profession that we are thinking about our clients and we're doing as much as we can within the constraints of perhaps being a publicly owned company or, or 
or trying to make a living for ourselves to, to put their interests above our own. Well, I said, we, we try here in the society to be the best society and also to be one of the best professional societies in the land. And my question would be, what do you think the benchmark should be? Who is a professional society right. that you say, boy, if you guys could be like X, you'd have to be able to, you know, show more value or show, you know, like who do, you, who do we look up to? Well, that's a, that's a, uh, a great question. I'm not sure I've got the answer to that because we're actually thinking through that benchmark process at the moment. I think I think different, prof I mean, I have to answer at sort of my level rather than at an Atlanta society level. But when I look at things, um, I think some, some um, businesses do it better. So I think accountants, of which I want, by the way, I think accountants do a great job in the AICPA here in the US, I think does a pretty good job of, um, uh, of, of, of uh, talking about its value. Um, we may not agree with it. I think the CFP has done a very good job on brand building uh, that we could learn a lot from. Um, so those are sort of, you know, where I look to sort of sort of benchmark myself at the moment. I think internationally there's another accounting outfit called the ACCA that's done a fabulous job in terms of convincing regulators around the world to recognize its, its uh, 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 designation. I guess when I look at that question, I, I sort of turn around and say, well, what do I want to be? One of the things I want to be world leading at at the institute level is to be a world leading, so this is why we go through this benchmark, benchmarking at the moment, a world leading membership organization. So the, the, the way I relate to you, the way I deliver services to you, not every service will be world leading, but the overall package should make us a world leading membership organization. That's where I want to get to. So I, I, I applaud your aspiration, but I don't have the answer for you in terms of who it is that we should be aspiring to accomplish. I suspect it's going to be different for everyone. Yeah, I think the actuarial is of the group. Yeah. It really does an excellent job with their exams. Yeah. I think that you know, one of the things that people here have asked about is tax, after tax yeah. analysis and making that a further designation. Because yeah. so, I think that different levels, I think like you say, you've achieved the CFA level, but yeah. Have you gotten your performance certificate? Have you gotten your after tax certificate? Have you gotten your, you know, yeah. I think, no, I, I think there, are, there are endless, there are endless add-ons that we can get into over time in terms of that. What, um, what, I, what I don't want to do, or my, my preference is not to chop the CFA up into pieces. I think when I look at the CFA and I look at what our unique selling proposition, if I put it that way, it's a generalist, um, one size fits all, uh, qualification that gets people um, a basic knowledge and gets them going in our profession. That's what we sell. Same exam here in Atlanta as it is in, in, in Beijing uh, or in Japan. So it's got a global standard to it, and it's got that sort of introductory level uh, feel. So I don't want to I don't want to start sort of chopping up the CFA, but building on top of that, yes, very definitely that's that's an option. Then it just comes down to mathematics, basically, as to whether we can get those things to work financially. Yes. Paul, well, um, uh, Atlanta doesn't ask questions, they usually give advice. So I'm going to ask two questions that are going to sound like advice. Um, one is, um, I was participating when you redid the uh, member, uh, the, the slogan, what do you call the mission statement. Um, and during the process, somebody in your staff, a high level guy, pointed out that we're the only uh, member organization that doesn't reference members in its mission statement. So. I would encourage you to revisit that. Uh, I love your focus on members, but it, we are, might want to mention them as yep. at least part of human society yep. that we serve. Well, can I just take that one? Sure. Uh, I'll tell you for why we don't, and we're, this is raging at the board level at the moment, and I'm fighting the member corner on it, not specifically to, to change the mission statement, but you know, what are we? When, uh, what, you know, what's your elevator pitch on the CFA? My elevator pitch is that we are a global membership organization geared towards building um, the investment management profession. So that's the way I say it. A lot of board members would say we're a global education right. business. Okay, so that's that's the that's why it's not in there. I suspect because there's a division as to with, with the academic educationalists and the practicing members, and I'm trying to resolve that. And I think I'm winning. Uh, on, on the side of saying we are a membership organization. Everything that we do should be about the members, trying to make the members the best professionals. If our members can be the best investment professionals out there, then that will attract everybody else into 
our membership over time and will establish us as that genuine sort of gold standard professional body. So that's that's how I'm trying to push it. Others say that's you're never that's that's a pipe dream. You're never going to get there. What we can do is to be a really good educational organisation. Challenge with that is I think there are lots and lots of better membership or uh, educational organisations than we are. Uh, if you look at where education is going in terms of online education, all of those things, I think we're really struggling to compete in that world. Okay, the second, uh, and I applaud that, that's fantastic. The second thing, and I think this sort of relates to, the first part is odd extra, this would be odd intra, uh, to help your staff understand that the way they talk to members is entirely different than the way they talk to candidates, because the members don't need them. Your point about what my value proposition is from my 275 is well taken. Um, and I'm really speaking to after you got the job, so that helped the staff understand how to prioritize engaging the experienced members. You have a lot of people here who have a lot of years under them, and they are not engaged in our local society and certainly not at the global level. So I think yeah. it's a staff priority. That yeah, I think you're no, I, I agree. I mean, senior membership engagement is an issue. Uh, is an issue uh, always around. Um, we have obviously ourselves to change as well, right? So I, I take that point. Um, not everybody in the institute is immediately in favour right. of of what I describe. There's no one against it, and actually, in general, I think it's been extremely well received. But it is for some people a little bit of a change. Comes back to this uh, this other thing that I've been trying to do at the Institute is to, is to open this out a little bit more. As a not-for-profit organization, we're very inwardly looking. Because we don't have uh, external pressures on us to any great extent, uh, and this is obviously a, 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 an over-dramatization for the sake of the conversation, what you've got is a lot of people who are doing things that essentially please themselves, as opposed to doing things that are for the members. Now, you know, they rationalize that actually they're doing it because there's a member value there, but they're not really starting from the perspective of what is it that you want, and reaching out and saying, what can I do to help you in your profession, and how can I deliver that? So we're trying to open up and change it around. When, when we talk about culture within the Institute, the words that come up all the time are very conservative, uh, no risks, uh, you know, those sorts of things. And I'm trying to, the, 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 what I'm trying to get into are open, transparent, and curious. That's what I'm trying to do is to change the, the culture of, of the organization to be more curious about its stakeholders and about the outside world in general. But we have, that's a multi-year journey uh, and uh, isn't gonna happen overnight, but I can promise you we're, we, we've embarked upon it. Do we have one more question? So, Paul, so one of the elephants in the room recently is this whole issue about the penny charter people. Yeah. And, you know, I think you certainly touched on a lot of aspects of that in terms of back in the day of the black and white picture, I think the CFA was like, we know you know a bunch of stuff, so now we're going to find a way to sort of quantify that and give you some credit, a charter, because you've demonstrated that. But it seems to me, certainly by your comments and my own observation, it's completely turned upside down now. So now we're like a college that people go through, maybe it takes them seven years to get through it, but they get through it, and they're like, so I don't want to join the alumni yep. association. Yep. Well, how do you get them to join the alumni association when you're in the situation of, well, yeah, we want to educate, and by the way, the organization, half of 600 some odd people are very vested in the educational side of it, and we're not so happy, we don't really care about the membership because don't they want to want that? No, they probably don't. And, and if that's where we are right now with these pending charter people, and I won't get into some of the efforts on the DRC side as far as, well, what do we do with these people? Because they've come through our system and they're representing things to employers or investors related to us. What, you know, where, where is the board and the staff on this? I mean, I think that's just no. a huge dissonance. Well, well I, I, I think it's an issue, and I think it's a dissonance. I mean, like, what we're trying to do is to work with employers and regulators to say that passing the exam is, is only part of it. What you need to have is also the experience. 
and a relevant experience so that the initials mean something in terms of your professional education. Yes. So uh, where, where we have to, where we're falling down is, and I take India as a case in point where we have the biggest child pending population mm -hmm. today, where we're falling down is that no employer knows the difference between passing level three and having a CFA. CFA okay. So that's where we've got to focus and also with regulators saying that there is a, qualify, a quantifiable quality difference between being a CFA and being a level three pass out. And you have to, uh, and for two reasons, one is obviously someone's got experience, but secondly, what are you trying to do with your own public projection to your own clients as well? You don't, you know, you're not just saying well, they've passed the exam, you're also saying that they're part of a professional community. And so we have to make that link much more strongly than we've done today. So I don't think there's a dissonance there, it's that there is a piece that's missing in the value chain that we don't, we haven't convinced employers that having CFAs is different to having level three pass outs. Well, let me ask you a follow on that. Has there been conversation around, and this goes back to where did this designation come from? So right now, I think, unless I'm possibly behind the times, it's a four-year experience requirement. Yes, yes, yes. All right. So if you, so back in the old days when we were trying to figure this out, those folks had much more experience than that, and so they're trying to demonstrate some knowledge here. Oh, so you know, are you folks talking about? Uh, with anybody in, inside the firm or out with regard to changing the experience requirement? Is that it, because it's like, well, so do we downplay the educational side of it, which, you know, half of the people that take this test can't pass it. So there's that part of it, which, you know, that's the candidate's problem, but what do we do about this experience side relative to the employers if that's really part of it and that's, I think, what we yeah, well the experience part is discussed every three years and we're about due for that conversation. Mm -hmm. And so we, we look at two main things every three years. We look at that four year thing, uh, which actually was increased from three years a few yes, years I back. We increased from three to four. And the second thing, we look at job families. What is it that you're actually doing and see whether that needs to be broadened or, or narrowed. Yeah. Um, the way that I think about this is, again, it comes back to what are we trying to do with the designation, which is if we believe that we're trying to make it a designation that is centered around the investment management profession, then we have to be much more rigorous than I think that we have been historically in the job families that are allowed to develop that uh, four-year experience. A couple of other strands of thinking that are going on at the moment as well which is that, as I said, you know, 40% of our members are actually in investment management, roughly speaking, 60% are not. Do we look at that and say that there is a practicing, you know, a CFA is uh, a practicing designation and the other 60% have something else, for instance. So there are conversations like that that are very much live at the moment, will also come into things like continuing professional education, whether it should be mandatory or not, uh, don't want to get into that today, but that is, uh, you know, if we if we drive to say that the CFA should represent to the general public a mark of someone whom they can trust to run their money, then are we doing enough to actually really give substance to that? Yeah, I think that's so. So I think that's that's very definitely the question. The other route is to say let's just open the designation up to everybody. And, uh, and it doesn't really matter whether you've got four years experience or not, or what you're working in, whether you're, uh, you know, you're, uh, uh, you know, whatever. Um, uh, you know, you should still, you can become a CFA because yeah. you've got the designation. So I think these are very, very important yeah, uh, conversations. My own, my own view is that we're a, you know, that, that we're a professional organization for investment management professionals. So we need to do more to prove that. And we need to do more to prove that having a CFA tells our clients something about us. I think it has a lot of ramifications for the Does. It has, it has a lot of ramifications for our revenue model. Oh, well, revenue. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and by extension for your revenue model to, to, in, in that I impacted at, at the margin. So, uh, yeah. so it, it's, it's, uh, it's not going to be it's not going to be a sort of a, a massive flip flop or anything like that. But I think it is. I think what we need to, to do is to keep is to keep 
driving our thought process into this, you know, what is it that we want to make? And, and I'll finish up one thought on that as well. Let's assume that the investment management profession fails miserably and is regulated out of existence. I, at the Institute, should gracefully accept that my time is done and die, basically. What I should not do is to try and turn myself into being something else. You know, the Engineers Institute or, or, or so. I think it's very interesting from that perspective when you really think about um, you know, should I buy other things, mergers and acquisitions, all that sort of thing? What, you know, what, what is it that we're really in business to do? And then that's the education side of, the, uh, of what we're doing. And the I education side, also, the education side is important for the credential, it's important for continuing professional education. But why do we do those things? Right. We do those things to build the best investment management professionals we can.